Shakespeare famously said, jealousy is the green-eyed monster that doth mock the meat it feeds on. And this is what we explore as well as faith, love, relationships, and how to maintain a bond throughout the sands of time. It's a deep chat as per keeping it real. But one thing I want to th- pose as a question and an idea before we kick into this podcast is forgiveness. Is there a way for whoever's caused you harm, whoever betrayed you, whoever hurt you, is there a way for you to forgive them? Not for them, but for you. What brings joy to your life? Life. Mm. Wow. The word is a small word, but it's a big, it's got a very big meaning behind it, I think. The way I look at life is, life is being grateful for anything and everything that we've got. Being grateful to God for every breath that we breathe. Every morning, every morning you have a reason to wake up. You have a beautiful family around you. You have a house to stay. You have food to eat. You've got such a beautiful nature around you. That's what life is according to me. And definitely there are a lot of hurdles, a lot of hiccups in anyone and everyone's life. No one's life is perfect. But looking at the positive side, getting motivated, looking at the positive side and just walking through the hard times is what life is. So winning is life. Winning in all the situations is life. Mm. When, when when's the moment in your life where you didn't feel like a winner? When you when you lost lost big. Uh I I guess losing is also important because losing is what t- teaches you how to improve, how to get better. And there are a lot of moments in my life where I've lost um, it's not one particular moment, but a lot of moments where I've lost. But I look at it the way that what have I learned from this and how can I get better in winning the next time if I pass through the similar kind of situation. Or if my losing can inspire someone's life so that they can win, that's an indirect win for me as well. Hmm. So is gratitude something you've had to develop? Like I've tried that different thing of feeling grati- uh, gratitude every morning and it's hard to feel two things at once. So if you're feeling grat- gratitude, you're probably not feeling much. And then it also trains your brain like Google. There's like a reticular activation system in your brain where it's kind of like it searches for what you look for. Like have you ever tried to get like a Ferrari, maybe not a Ferrari, but a red car and uh, you start noticing it everywhere? You're like, oh, there's, there's my car. There's my car. And so the same way where you focus your brain to find things, it works the same way, I imagine, with gratitude. If you keep training yourself to find things to be grateful for, how do you balance being grateful and being real? You know, so acknowledging that I'm grateful, but also being real that I don't feel good right now. And I need to express I that. think that's... That's something that probably everyone goes through it. It's more about taming your mind. And it is not something that can happen overnight. Probably um, 10 years ago, if you would have asked me this question, my focus was more on getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And now my focus is getting on better, not bigger. So how you're taming your mind is something that teaches you all this and uh, being real versus being grateful is something that is always a challenge us being a human being me being a human being definitely I I lose my breaks too sometimes I get upset I get angry I could or may speak something that was not required or I could have responded instead of reacting but that's how you learn isn't it so it's like just trying to balance between the two. I know one of the two situations will always weigh a bit more than the other. And learning when you are getting a bit loose is probably 
training you for the next time to be better so yeah it's it's a challenging thing which i am trying to impose on myself from <laughs> last few years <laughs> yeah. yeah i am pushing myself towards it and i see that it's giving me a lot of peace instead of um, a lot of stress Mm. I, I always find stress interesting. Like my friend was saying the other day that you can't feel an emotion longer than five minutes. After that, you're choosing to feel it. So basically, you stress in a way is a choice because you have the experience, the pain. The pain is temporary, even if it's chronic. You know, there's waves of extremities of pain. And then you're adding your interpretation on it that makes the pain continue, which is stress. What do you, what do you think stress is? Or how have you found useful ways to manage stress? Uh, I think it's what your friend was saying is pretty much it's just a temporary moment, but how you conceive it or how you grow it in yourself is what is, it is you're taking it to a different level. So basically, don't let the stress stay between your two years. So it's all over here, right in your mind. And it's exactly between your ears. So if if it's all in your mind, then you are just kind of, con- you have conceived it and you are just giving birth to that or you are just growing it bigger and bigger in your mind. Now, that is something which I am still not able to control 100%. Being an emotional person, I... I take a too I take too much of it on my head and then if I think that I am kind of getting really stressed probably I'll go to the gym listen to some um preaching do some uh listen to some motivational speaker and do gym at the same time so that gives me a lot of uh, relief from my stress mm. yeah uh, could- yeah I'm trying to, uh, I'm trying to, like, you're down here. I'm trying to look at the camera, so I can't read your facial expressions to know when you're going to talk. So I'm weighing it up. I might just not look at the camera and just look. But anyways, uh, I, I think I think meditation gets a, a bad name when it's in actual fact what you just did, which is like, hey, you had these thoughts. And it's like a river. You can jump in the river and add to it, like, Oh, this person says you're ugly. Yeah, I'm ugly. I'm a piece of shit. I'm this, I'm that. And then you're going down the river. But the moment that you remove yourself from the weather, river and either focus on gratitude or an external thing or gym or motivational videos, you're having a, a moment where the river's not pulling you so you can see the outside. The challenge, though, is you're not necessarily addressing why you feel stressful you're distracting it until the river, like the you're making a dam that's about to overflow and it's still going to hit you. You're having a break, but the stress is still coming. So where do you think your style of being an emotional person comes from? Were you, were you taught that as a child to be emotional and that's how you get your way or you w- witnessed it? Where do you think that comes from? Some part of it could be from my upbringing, definitely. And the rest is, uh, I would say, got added to me when I started uh, being more grateful about things and started believing more into God and started doing a lot of community work within whatever I can do. So when I look at others who are in trouble or who are going through a hard moment, I don't know, somehow I start, you know, tears come out of my eyes anytime. I can't control them. I get very emotional. I'll just give you an example. I used to be in IT career before and I left my IT job in 2015. And last week, one of my colleagues' father-in-law passed away. And they just put it on Facebook on about the funeral. And I left everything and I just went to that funeral. Though she was not expecting me. But somehow, I got emotional for that moment. And I said, if I can't be in 
happiness with you, that's fine. But when you're sad, I have to be there. And that is something which is building more and more in me. So I'm getting more emotional, probably. I, is it because I'm getting older? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Age that brings your hormones. <laughs> Testosterone, <laughs> estrogen's coming into you, coursing into your veins. <laughs> Grow some tits. Yeah. So, yeah. so j- just on that, because um, I, 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 I'm similar in the sense that I would feel a lot about what other people are feeling. You know, they call like an empath. I don't know if I resonate with that, but it's like if someone cries, I cry. But then I realized I started adding to their problem and I was actually mm. having my problem through them. So, how do you navigate between being there for someone and not adding? your emotion like caring without stacking that makes sense wow it makes sense definitely it makes sense so probably um i would not be relating myself on them when i'm trying to console them or just stand by them it's more about being morally there with them so probably how can i say that um Probably, let's say, I went to this funeral. Now, I know what they are going through, and I cannot 100% feel that because it's not something related to my family. Now, all I did is just went there, give the guy a big hug, tried just kind of, you know, uh, consoling them. I think that was more than enough to take away their kind of uh, heaviness from them. I'm not saying much there. It's just my action or my face or my gesture is trying to give them a moral support probably. I will not add myself into that and say more than anything that will stack to their problems. Hmm. How how do you, because, you know, I find... I find people tell me things they never tell other people because there's no reason to fear telling me something. And then also they come to me when things are fucked. <laughs> so so when you care too much and people keep coming to you with their worst moments like suicide or fucking, you know, they're about to kill themselves or they had a breakup, they're financially fucked. Wow. What, how do you separate yourself from ca- you care so much but then you need to go home the same way that you have work? When you go to work, you focus on work, but it's not your family's fault that you had a shit day. It's not your friend's fault that they try to kill themselves and you got to support them, but then you got to carry on with life. How do you transition between either supporting or work and then going into the next thing of home? That's that's very interesting. And I, I would say that definitely there is something in you that people get connected and that's why they are trusting and opening up in front of you. Me being in this profession where I'm doing mortgages, I'm trying to save, um, I mean, help people with their dreams. There are a lot of incidents when people do open up in front of me, whether it could be a, a sad, sad tear or a happy tear. So I don't know yet, but whatever the situation, definitely... I feel privileged when someone is opening up and getting lighter in front of me. Not You don't get that very often in this fast life. And if you can give someone some peace, definitely you are doing the right thing. I believe that if you are a human being, you always get an opportunity to help someone. So, if we are sticking with that, definitely it's a good thing. And that's what something I've engraved in my family as well. So my my wife, my son, my daughter, all of them are similarly emotional. So hmm. that's what I put in them as well. So if I have gone through a heavy day by making someone's life a bit lighter, I'll just go and probably tell my family that this is what I went through and they try to give me peace or try to make me lighter in a similar manner. So it's just a chain kind of thing. They don't 
add up to me that why did you come late or I'm they would say that I'm glad that you helped those people that's so positive about it so that's how my family is with me hmm. was that a conscious effort because you know I I used to train sales teams and uh, the number one reason they would quit is because of what they went home to and the reason I say that it's commissionally sales, there's going to be good days, bad days, great days. And you come home and you start telling your wife, oh, I made no money today. They're like, oh, quit. Oh, I'm really upset. I got rejected by 100 people today. Oh, quit. How did you start framing it or did you make a conscious effort to explain to your children and to your partner that this is my work and this is how it's going to be and I would like some support? Or is it the more that you demonstrated as a father and as a partner empathy what do you think has led to your family being supportive of what you do i've always been very transparent with my family even um let's talk about 2012 i know the exact date as well it was 11th of december 2012 why i remember this because on 12th of december 2012 I was buying my first investment property. So on 11th of December, 2012, at night, I was sitting with my kids. My daughter was 12 years then, and my son was just six years. And my wife with me. So all four of us sitting. I said, kids, tomorrow is a big, big day for us. I am buying my first investment property. I have no experience in this, but I am doing it. There's a big risk involved. Either we'll lose this house or we'll make more houses from that house. But what is the worst case scenario? We will, we might have to go to a rental property if we lose everything. But I promise you, I give you unlimited internet over there. As well. <laughs> so I just added a bit of humor in there <laughs> because that is their age. You know, their age was more into just internet. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And then I would ask them, are you with me in this? And both of them said, yes, Papa, we are with you. And my wife said, yes, we trust you. Go ahead. So this is something mm. that I have taught my kid from day one. So if I'm going through a hard time, I will teach them and tell them what is going on in my life. And I've always seen that they've come out with a different perspective of the whole scenario. And they will encourage me and I can easily fight through it. And I think it's just a teamwork. You cannot win by yourself. It has to be a team. And your family is your biggest team. Mm. You, you said something interesting there around involving them in the decision. And I think that's an important thing in leadership that I need to keep learning is like, if I was to let my mind go, I would be a micromanaging person that doesn't trust anyone and thinks I'm better than them. If I just was to be my ego self. But I'm learning, you know, to, to give the responsibility of solving the problem to the person because they're more invested in it. So what you did there is you explained to your children's situation. They made a consensual decision to be a part of it to support you. Do you, do you think as well, though, like I, I, I talk to a lot of fathers and they feel the sense of burden of providing security to their family at the expense of their happiness. And then there's a certain threshold where they keep going when the return on happiness for their family doesn't go with it. It actually comes at a cost to their family because they keep trying to make more and more money. How do you balance between having this desire to provide for your family but also to, to live a fulfilling life? I think it comes with age and experience in my case. Um, before COVID, as I said, I was always focusing on being big, 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 big. And uh, probably uh, when you're thinking of big, you could lose on the quality of how you're going. Now, after COVID, my thinking has totally changed. I totally believe in being better in everyday life than being bigger. So balancing this is definitely coming with an experience and your body or your trust in God or 
you know sometimes god tells you in different manner so during covid i was quite busy with my mortgages suddenly the property property market you know how it spiked and uh, i would work probably from 4 am till 11 pm in the night so what i did is i could not come to office so i just put a desk in my bedroom <laughs> so i did not know when yeah. to cut off right <laughs> i did not know how to cut off or when to cut off and i continued doing that for so many days and suddenly one day around midnight i collapsed and my wife had to call ambulance and i was taken into emergency and the next day i started thinking what was i doing why was i doing it? so my why changed after that so that was an important probably uh incident or event in my life that has changed my why from bigger to better and my wife why became my family in a more kind of uh, you know quality not quantity wise so that is where i switched in my why mm that's interesting yeah cuz i heard Someone said to me, "Anxiety is having too many choices, and knowing not not which one to do." And you, it's interesting you talk about more and more and more, and instead of better in quality, because like if you always doing more, I find it quite hard if I've got all these different things to do, and I have no priorities and I have no structure, and I feel anxious, overwhelmed, and stressed. And when actual fact, I can only do one thing at a time, and I can only do the most important thing. So, what? you you talked a lot about god what is and it seems like you've grown a, a closer relationship with god what has led to that uh strengthening relationship and also what does god mean to you this is an easy question <laughs> this goes back to when i was probably 15 16 years old i always saw my dad uh, every morning after shower he would sit and pray in the temple that we had made in the house and probably i started putting that into myself as well so i started doing that from age 16 and i did that for almost probably i would say 15 20 years of that i followed that every morning i would probably this is when i was following hindu religion so i would stand on one feet and do a prayer for 15 20 minutes just doing like that on one feet and then after that well, doing one some foot ritual. one foot yeah you're balancing like a flamingo yeah, balancing. is that a thing like, or yeah. is there a showing off yeah No, who? There's no one looking at me. <laughs> I'm not showing up. Goddess. It's more about. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I think uh, probably it was more like it became very much like a ritual in my life, and gradually what I realized that there is no connection happening. It's more about just a ritual, and I had a fear that if I don't do this, then. The, then god will get upset with me hmm. and things will not work and but then some things happened in my life here in new zealand in 2010 onwards and after that in 2012 i got saved and i became a born again christian hmm. after that i started thinking life in a different manner and that's where i started developing a lot of uh, connection with god directly so what i did is basically i removed all the idols out of my connection with god so i was doing a connection i was connect looking at the idol and then i was trying to connect with god that was my initial process but then what i did is i removed the idol and i started establishing my connection directly with god it was a long journey definitely but then i started feeling the connection getting stronger day by day and mm. that's where i got bigger and bigger or closer and closer to god um then 
after that, experiencing that connection for a few years, that's where I switched into gratitude mode, being grateful after that. So it was a journey. It's not something that happened overnight. And even now, probably, if I show you my office, I have a Bible sitting next to me. I pray when I come in the office. I pray when I leave the office. Hmm. I wake up. The first thing is I go on my knees and pray and thank God for everything. Then the moment I come out of the house, the first thing is I look at the sky and thank God for the day. And that's how I start my day. I just don't miss out any opportunity of thanking God. Whatever the situation, even if it's the worst situation of my life, I say that I know you are doing it. You want to teach me something? I'll face it because you are with me. And that's how I'm talking to God all the time. Mm, interesting. Because, yeah, I'm fascinated with religion from a psychological standpoint. You know, I'm I'm not, I'm atheist, but uh, I support people in their pursuit. Because the interesting thing to me is like you're, whether God's real or not, is you're spending a majority of your life trying to connect with something that you perceive as loving and caring and also an aspiration to be something more. So it's almost, I always sort of saw God as like your subconscious self. It's your ability to connect to your higher self. And if you keep, if you keep focusing on that and trying to connect and love and be the best version of yourself and, and, and establish gratitude, you know, whether, whatever your belief system is, I can't see that being a negative. And then combining I sort of see church in the same way that I see a sports team, uh, a unified version of play where you're not the focus. So when you go networking, you go to one-on-one, it's about you. It's confronting, it's fearful, and it's in a way selfish, except for you're focusing on them and caring about them. But when you're part of a community where the focus isn't you, it's about the game that you play. I think humans need that. And that's what happens when people get older is they don't have sports teams and especially men don't have friends and then they stop working, then they die in like a few years because I used to be a retirement planner so I just see them just... <laughs> right. Right. So what, what, is there a story uh, that stands out to you in the Bible or a verse that you resonate with? It's a bit hard for you just to pull it out of the bag if you, I can't remember things, but is there any story that you think has, if more people knew it would be better for their lives? There are a couple of stories that really did the difference in my life, but it's quite a bit of personal kind of leveled story wherein I started writing a book on that because I thought that after following what I was following earlier and what I was going through that particular incident or what my family was going through that particular incident, if my God then did not help me at that particular point and suddenly there's a third person coming in and bringing in different faith in the house and just by one prayer that whole thing changed for the whole family how powerful that god is so definitely that incident in my family triggered that switch over and me being born again and then talking about god all the time and uh, being grateful, it all happened from that one or two incident that happened in our life in 2010 and 11. Hmm. It's quite personal, so I would probably <laughs> leave, it in, leave it in the family. Yeah, yeah, no, fair enough. I like, um, yeah, I like, I like the story. I don't know if I'm remembering it right. It might not even be in the Bible because I went to Sunday school because they had free food. So, uh, and there's a church, so I, I, learned the, I learned the Bible pretty good. Um, but I can't remember if this is actually in the story, but he talks about, you know, like, let's say, let's make up a story. Hopefully it's in the Bible, but I don't think it is. So this guy, he was stranded uh, and he was in a tough situation. And then someone came along and said, hey, do you need help? And he's like, oh, no, no, I'm waiting for God. 
and then they send something else, another gift, another opportunity. Yeah. Someone else offers to help in a different way. So no, 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 I'm waiting for God to help me. And then when he finally has a chat with God and God's like, he's like, why didn't you help me, God? He's like, well, I did. I sent you all these opportunities. So how do you balance between having this all-knowing, loving self and all-powerful and keeps you accountable, having that and knowing that they got you back in some way if you do the right thing. You're a born, you're a born sinner, so you just you know ask forgiveness and then you're good. How do you balance relying on them and being your own man? See, we, we all have a limit of what we can do at the most. We don't, sometimes things are out of our control. It can be work, it can be anything personal, or it can be anything else that's out of our control. So definitely I believe there is something divine about all of us which controls all this. So when I know I can handle a situation, it's in my control, then probably I am taking the ownership of that. But when I know this is not something I can handle, it's above my capacity or it's not something I can take take over, that's when I give it to God. So I just tell him, you take over the situation. It's beyond my control. You drive from here. Hmm. Whatever you do, I'll take it as uh, something coming from you, whether it's a positive thing or a negative thing. Even if it's negative, that's fine. It's still, it's coming from you. So definitely you have a reason behind it. Yes. So, you know, when you are asking something from God, you would, God would say, yes, no, I've got something better for you. These mm. are the only two situations we could have. So that's how I take it. I've, I've seen some pushback from people about God and saying, if God was so loving and so amazing, why would there be cancer? Why would be these horrible things? And I, I actually think, Life without suffering is not really that good. I think kind of like food. Like if you always had food and you never felt hungry, what would food taste like? You know, if you never had that, the absence of food. So I wonder as well then what's heaven? Like if heaven is this amazing, wonderful place, is it all just rays and sunshine or is there suffering? And that's actually what makes it heaven? Or what, what do you think heaven is? Well, just easy questions today. We'll move off religion because it's very personal, but <laughs> I just like it. So. Heaven. Wow. That word sounds so powerful. And that's something that drives all of those who are in this kind of direction, probably, in this faith. Suffering is definitely, if I look at God, Jesus, he being God, he he went through a lot of suffering. And that suffering was something that he could easily kind of control it, right? Because he was God, he could do anything. When he being a God has to suffer so much, definitely we being human being, suffering is something which is a part of our life. You know, when you go to a hospital and you see some patient and there's a cathode ray attached to his um, heart and you can see his uh, heartbeat going up and down, up and down. But the moment his heartbeats are straight, it means he's dead. So we, we need that up and down in the life to stay alive. And that's where we give him, that's where God comes in and kind of, make things happen and we believe in it hmm. that's interesting you said as, as long as we're not going up and down we're not living <laughs> yeah 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 wow how, how do you because i noticed um people people that get wounded they they invest very little into life they they have a consistent state of emotion they don't have two extremities of joy they might get stressed and angry but they they don't give much out of fear of losing it again. So they never live. They're flat like that line you talked about. What, what, what do you think is 
helped in li- making your life fulfilling? Because obviously you were very emotional before. You had stressful moments. You developed a, You wanted to be big, 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 big. What do you think as you've aged, you've learned brings more joy and fulfillment to your life? I think uh, it's the small moments that make the big difference in one's life. Not every moment is a perfect moment. (laughs) But when you are spending a good couple of minutes also with someone which is something that you love from inside or something that brings that little smile on your face as well. That is a joy which you are enjoying. So if we are expecting something all the time, definitely we may be not happy all the time. But if we have minimum expectations, but at the same time, we are enjoying where we are, whether it's hardship, whether it's sacrifice, whether it's a growth, or whether it's just slowdown, whatever mode of life you are in, if you're just p- picking the positive part of it and looking at it in a very positive manner, definitely you will see life is getting better and better for you. Doesn't matter, see, winning and losing is a part of life, but enjoying the journey itself is a big thing. Mm. You could crib about it, you could complain about it. You know, uh, how I would look is you have Three alphabets, E, B, and C, remove them out of your life. E is excuse, so no excuse. B was, what was B? C is complain, so stop complaining. And B is, sorry, I put E, B, C. This is something I try to follow all the time. I think, sorry, it just skipped out of my mind. I'll come back to it as soon as it comes back. EBC is something I remove out of my life. And the other thing that I follow is BCD. So B is your birth, D is your death, and C is the choices you pick in your life. That choices is either making you happy, joyful, peaceful, or destroying you. So it's your choices, what you choose in your life is between your birth and death that takes you wherever you are going. Hmm. There's an interesting study they did on choices um, with paintings, funnily enough. There's two groups. One could pick a painting. They're not allowed to change their mind. That's their painting. The other one could change their mind in six months. And you'd think the one that had more choice would be happier, but the ones that could only pick one were the happiest. And I think that's a, a real challenge in like modern dating at the moment is that you got these choices, you swipe, you think you know you're hot shit, and you got all these options. But in reality, <laughs> not so much me. I'm more of an in person because Tinder's taught me that I'm not that pretty. But uh, I, I've got some people like me. So, what what is, what is your perception of choice in the sense that like, do you think having more choice is at people's detriment, or how do you determine between what's a good choice? And what's a bad choice? (laughs) Choosing, definitely choosing is sometimes difficult. And when you have too many options, it gets more complicated and difficult. When you have less options, definitely, I think you are more happier, less confused. So choice is probably a difficult decision-making The less, the better. That's what I would say. The less, the better. Hmm. And as you are saying about swiping, yes and no, (laughs) yes and no. Where this world is going, I don't (laughs) know. But, oh my God. When I was young, I never had those choices. (laughs) And I would not do that even if I had those choices. Mm. That's impressive. I think... It's something that is uh, marriages are made in heaven, you know how they say. 
Marriages are made in heaven. Well, maybe I should ask your advice because uh, I've been a free spirit and uh, only learning about commitment now where I'm actually, because I was using excuses not to commit but out of fear of vulnerability. So I would get my value from my ability to attract a girl um, and then not commit because of my insecurities. And I kept thinking, oh, I, I need to find the right partner instead of be the right partner. And I'm only trying to be the right partner recently at 32. So what do you think What to these young people listening with all these choices, swiping, and, and you're a man that's had a long-term relationship. Maybe it's good, maybe it's bad, but it's been, it's, you know, like a like the heart thing. But what, what do you think is, yeah. has worked for you to stay at it? I'll answer that before. You know how I was talking about ABC and I oh, you remember? missed on B? Yeah, yeah it, it came it's come back now. So A is excuse, B is blame, and C is complain. So this is something that if mm. we avoid, things are much better. Now, coming to your point about commitment, I see that, again, I'm not judging anyone over here, but I see that the young generation is scared of committing into anything. Even when you're looking for a job, you are not looking for a long-term uh, commitment towards a job. You're just kind of stepping fast up there, moving from one job to another job, one position to another position to grow. Same way, the fear of committing is because I see that everyone wants a, their own space. Probably that space, anyone interfering in that space is what is scaring them of commitment. Now, I feel that when two people have committed for each other or towards each other, you cannot get everything out of, I mean, everything best out of each other. You have to get, you know, there are good and bad things in every human being. Even, even, even if you're getting a pet in the house, it's a big commitment, right? It's a big commitment. I had two fish in my aquarium last year and... <laughs> One of my fish was sick and dying. I fasted for two days just to revive it, and it lived. Oh, you fast for two so, days to revive? I thought you were going to eat it. That's a, sorry, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, I was just praying for it to come back to life, oh, wow. and it came back to life. So if I have a plant in my house, it's my commitment that I have to water it because it's my responsibility. It's in my house. So I, if I get something in my house or if I get someone in my life, I take it as my commitment, whether it's good, bad, whatever day it is, it's my commitment, I have to fulfill it. So I think that is what is missing to a good extent in this fast life. Mm. And, where we, and we have to compromise at many situations. And that's a part of life. And if we are happily doing it, you're happy how do you balance like so i'm learning more about the commitment part now and committing to people and and not finding excuses to run the part i challenge struggle with is at what point should you not commit you know i mean sometimes people are fundamentally wrong for you and they they cross boundaries that you might have defined or maybe you don't know what your boundaries are how do you balance the the forever with the actually they're part-time serial killer. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> I know, I know. I get the point. And definitely we've got a lot of those uh, uh, kind of experience in life wherein um, we think we've committed into a wrong thing or we shouldn't have done that. Now, this is something I learned from one of my friends here. And he, he told me this probably I would say 18 or 19 years ago. He said, you come to New Zealand, it's a different culture than India. Learn one thing, learn to say no. I never wanted to say no, but I learned to say no. Now, where I think that I'm taking, someone is taking me for a ride or I'm getting used in some manner, probably I'll stay, say no bluntly. I might get a bit rude on saying no or probably I'll quietly start stepping back 
and come out of that relationship where I know that I'm getting used, abused, or just someone is riding on us. Hmm. It has to be a bit, um, yeah, that's where probably I change my tone as well. I have to sometimes. Yeah. What's your thought on trust? Like I have a bit of a, I get a lot of shit for my view, which is I, I don't trust anyone because I don't believe trust is a thing. I believe trust is you trying to analyze a person's behavior in the future. That's not to say I don't invest in them vulnerably. I don't give them all my money and say, hey, you know, I focus more on being okay if if that trust is broken and trying to be a man that's comfortable with the adversity of life. How do you do? You think you foster trust in a relationship? You know the jealousy and how to communicate that, or how do you even trust a human knowing that they're full of snakes? You know what I mean? That they're good and bad. Yeah, um, that's that's also something. Probably uh, many a times I would think, as in you know, gut feeling. What do you feel about this when you see someone? When you meet someone? you get some kind of vibration. I, I listen to that vibration. I listen to my gut feeling. Um, if it's business or if it's something that I have to continue with that because business is totally based on trust. And when you know that you're bound to do a business with someone wherein there is very little trust in that relation, there is a chance that you could lose on that. But it depends how much are you ready to give at that point. So based on that gut feeling, I proceed or may not proceed with that trust thing. But definitely trust plays a very big role in my day-to-day business, in my life, and whatever I do. Um, probably sometimes I end up trusting a bit too much on snakes as you said (laughs) and when they bite me yeah that's when i learn from that but once i've learned probably that i won't allow them to bite me again but yeah i could be wrong i am wrong many times and that's a lesson of life which we learn we don't expect ourselves to be right all the time well a fascinating thing uh, uh, they did it with children they told a teacher they said this student's really talented and they lied to them about the exam results. They said, this kid did really well. And funnily enough, that kid be, did really well. Even though they did shit initially, it's because the, the teacher believed in them. And that's the, that's the other thing. It's like, okay, this person might be full of snakes. But if you believe in their best intention, they might rise up to that expectation. And it's like a self-fulfilling prophecy. It's like, if you think someone's going to cheat on you, you're going to make sure they do. <laughs> or hurt you or whatever yeah. uh, th- this is this is heavy chat but like how do you deal with jealousy have you ever had it or do you not get it do you are you just like you know yeah the big j is always something that <laughs> probably gets into everyone's mind i don't see anyone saying that i don't think if anyone says that they're not jealous is something i would not say it's true <laughs> everyone goes to it every human being even even dogs do that right even dogs get jealous if uh, they uh, see their owner yeah. being with some uh, some other dog they get possessive right so human being is definitely jealousy is a part of human being and I've gone through that many a times when I was with the mindset of uh, bigger, bigger, bigger. That's where jealousy was also bigger, bigger, bigger. (laughs) Um, But when you start being grateful and when you start slowing down things, when someone is growing, you feel good about it. Jealousy starts, you know, that capital J starts getting into smaller J and then it converts into something else. So it's it's a journey probably. It's not something that you would control or I would control. And when you are jealous, you have different ways of, you know, responding to that or reacting to it probably. Sometimes you just end up speaking loud. Sometimes you express it in your expressions or maybe in your deeds 
somehow you will express it somehow you will show that you are jealous and that's very normal you can sense it hmm. yeah I, i went a bit deep in it lately i, I was looking at like, what what is the evolutionary benefit of jealousy like why do they why would we be jealous it seems like it could come at the cost of relationships and friendships and and then you look into it and it's like well the people that are jealous are more likely to pass on their genes because you think about the one that's naive and and trust and that you know their partner goes out on this this you know adventure and goes to the other tribe and then is impregnated by someone else and you you are completely oblivious then your genetic uh your genetics aren't passed on so there's an a benefit to being jealous but the art is how to communicate it in a way where it's unhealthy. When do you think it becomes unhealthy? We'll move off this. We're not going to talk about mortgages yeah. in case you're wondering. <laughs> mortgage is boring. Jealousy. Now, see, you know how we started our conversation that it's all in your mind. Probably that's where jealousy would sit here as well. So how long you allow to sit there? And when you see someone growing and you are getting jealous, probably... you need to go back to yourself to did, did myself did i work as hard as that person who is more successful than me probably i would question myself there rather than being too jealous on him probably i would start pushing myself more harder into how i can you know uh, reach that level or get better you know, there is a saying something that you know people say that people start talking about you only when you've overtaken them or you are ahead of them so that's where the jealousy comes in right when you are ahead of someone mm. but when you are out of that rat race of life when you want to keep peace as your highest level of uh, priority for life then you are out of that rat race and when you are out of the rat race probably jealousy also uh evaporates from there. Hmm. What what do you think about haters like you know people you they say oh you got to have an enemy to keep you motivated. I, I don't believe in that and they also say prove your haters wrong. Like what I found is two things happen when someone hates on my content. Either they're right or they're hurting. Cuz or they maybe they're stupid and they didn't they gave advice and <laughs> like it was just bad fire. I don't know, but usually it's they're in pain or they're right. So both are valuable. And usually if I ask about them, "Oh, what makes you say that?" and then they start opening up and then they feel valued and then they feel like then they turn into a follower and then they like your content. It's interesting. Um how do you navigate that, you know, as you develop your success in life and people that you didn't expect to bring you down start bringing you down or making passive comments or how do you deal with that? I I hate hate word is very negative for me i take that word very negatively in my life and i hate only one thing in life and that is driving i hate <laughs> i don't like driving at all get a tesla and i have a tesla <laughs> that's the only reason i bought tesla because i hate driving i like two wheeler and you know from last 20 years i'm asking my wife let me buy a two wheeler even if it's a bicycle or a scooty you know that electric scooty which doesn't go about 60 kilometers per hour she doesn't allow me to that and <laughs> i said she driving is something i hate this is the only negative feeling i have with that word about hate is driving and you are not allowing me to buy a small scooter also and she said no i don't want you to try, uh, go on a two wheeler so hate is something i this is the only part where i've allowed hate into my life is driving mm. and that's where i ended up buying tesla yes when i'm going for a longer drive it gives me a bit of uh, um you know relief that i can put it on auto mode <laughs> yeah. and it's a bit smart for me so it's good and the other part is you know in tesla which i like is there are not too many uh, those things on the dashboard that confuse you or that stress you that i have to keep an eye there keep an eye there keep an eye there that's too much to take in and you're driving at the same time 
So Tesla is just one screen and that's it. So it gives me more of a peace. Otherwise, I get too stressed driving and that's why I hate driving. But hate is a negative word and I try avoiding that. And I teach that to my kids every day. You know how uh, kids these days say, I hate that, I hate that. I don't care about it. And I try to switch them from using that word of hate in their life because that brings negativity. That brings a lot of negativity. And that's what I don't want in their life or my life. Yeah, no, valid. I mean, forgiveness is probably the most valuable thing I've ever learned. Is because, I, I, like, as soon as the bully stops bullying you, then you're bullying yourself. And mm. this is the same thing. Blame is giving someone power over you. It's like that the B word that you added into your CBD. I can't remember. I think the acronym EBC. EBC. Um, well, we've done fifty-five minutes. So, what would be your closing remark for people that? are haters and they have hate in their heart and you would like them to reflect on one thing, what would that be? When you have hate in your heart, it's more about showing that you are going through a lot of things which are beyond your control. Probably you've got too much in your head, too much in your heart and you need someone in front of whom you can open up and, you know, I say that crying is a very good habit. If you can cry and get lighter, do that. Because when you cry and you start again, basically, so you cry, you're going down. But when you're starting again, you're starting in a more positive manner, more energetic, more stronger than what you were before. So crying is a very good habit. I cry very often in front of my wife or just by myself or maybe in front of my God. I cry very often when I am hurt, when I am down, when I am filled with a lot of uh, frustration or trying to, you know, fight if there is some hate that's trying to come into me for someone. And you end up meeting so many characters in your life who are uh, taking you to that kind of... Uh, mindset where you start hating them so definitely opening up in front of someone whom you trust will lighten you and probably you'll start forgetting hate hate is very negative avoid if possible just just walk away hmm. all right well i'm gonna walk away from this podcast so thanks for coming on mate Thank you. Thank you for taking me to a different level of talk. I was expecting this to be more on basis of mortgages. Well, well I think that's, that's a different level above what I was expecting. But I would like to thank you with coming up with such amazing questions. And I don't know, where are you getting those questions from? I'm winging it's, it. I don't know. God. No, it's... <laughs> Yes, God, you accepted that, see? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I think you were super wise, very wise with those questions. And it's not easy to, you know, give someone comfort with your question and getting so much out of that person. Probably you've given me a opportunity to open myself. I've never done this before. This is the first time I'm talking with someone to that level and how much we know each other. Hardly. Mm. But still, I could open up so much. So the credit goes to you. All the credit goes to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, brother. <laughs>